there. So we are ready now to start a demo for you. We have discussed equipment, we have discussed process, and now we're going to put all of this together and show you a procedure actually on a painting. And we have a photo that we've brought to show you and Jeannie has already done her sketch. And so we're going to start looking at those elements first and also show you the other things that we've talked about before and how they apply to what she's doing now. Mm -hmm. And we've uh, taken our inside out. When I do a painting outside, I do the same application as when I do a painting inside. So this process is the same process I do for my studio paintings. So you want them outside and inside to look really similar. It's the same artist that did it, should be the same style, same process. So this is what we're gonna talk about a little bit. Doing a little sketch. This is organizing your thoughts. This is getting um, your foundation. I did it with a little marking pen, so I didn't noodle a little bit. So let's take a look here at um, some of the things we talked about a little bit ago on the elements that we think about and how to maybe improve the scene a little bit and how to avoid the things that could make it look boring or kind of static and, and not of much interest. So you'll you remember this one that we've done where we don't line things up in the middle. We want some variety, some back and forth on things. Notice the level here of the horizon line in the picture is high in this case. We have lots of vegetation here. We have trees in the background. We have bushes in the foreground. Not equal spacing between those bushes. More like this where we've got a couple close together that maybe read almost as one and then a little bit of room. This one kind of goes to balance that we talked about down here. So we don't want it evenly spaced. We don't want it widely different. That feels out of balance. But the larger one, a little closer into center, which is perfectly an example of this one, because as you see here on this painting, on here, this is that asymmetrical symmetry. It's a big group here. This little nugget right here helps to balance this bigger shape. Uh, also, this helps to lead in. You want to find direction, leading in and around your painting. Also, finding ways to have diagonals that are pointing to where you would like your focal. So then when we look at the example of dynamic points, you'll notice that that larger bush is down here on this bottom one, and then the secondary focal point is kind of almost right across from us at this one. But this is still the dominant one. And we talked about large puzzle pieces. And you can really see how there are just nice shapes that are fitting together. There's variety in the shapes. There is movement through this little creek bed area and this little creek in the background. And those diagonal lines that she's used to kind of pull all the supporting areas into the focal point. It's that theatrical stage again. Her soloist is on the stage and everything else is a supporting cast that goes with it. So then I've, I've uh, taken my sketch and from my sketch, line drawing first, and then I filled in some of these shapes. So this is just like a, a floor plan for me. Just as we talked about earlier, doing a, a little value study out there that could be as far as you get if the weather comes up, but now you have your value range, your darks, your middles, your lights, and you can go back to the studio if you have some reference photos. After you have transferred your drawing on, these are some of the things that you think about. Notice that she has no fine little things, no little noodling things and stuff in here. Notice that she's got large masses and everything is kind of laid out. She can already tell where her background is, middle ground and foreground, and how there's an interesting movement of line and shape. Notice the angle that this little riverbed has. It has movement and it pulls your eye kind of back through the scene where this would not. Then when we go and look at the bottom one here and establish a strong direction of light and shadows and stay with it. She has established her shadows on the vegetation, in the background, that adds to that feeling of movement that you can move back through the picture with your eye. All of this helps create depth, um, dimension, and interest in a painting, the things that you really want to achieve in the painting. 
And we mentioned having ways to lead in. You don't want uh, big walls that keep you from getting back into the painting. And as I look at this, this group of trees is a little bit in front of this next one, which is further back. I'm going to make this one lighter. Than this one to put it back. So that'll help create even more movement as your eyes going through with this being pushed back later. You kind of feel like maybe you could go around that group of trees and then the mountains are pulled into the picture as well. So the other thing that we wanted to mention uh, before we get started here on this is Jeannie used a, a transparent oxide and drew her painting in with her paintbrush. She didn't draw it in with a pencil or anything like that. She drew it in with a paintbrush. Then she used varying light and darkness of that same color to create the shadows, the dark areas, and stuff. So she can already tell what this is going to look like. I almost know at this point whether I'm going to like it or not. What's nice about coming in with the drawing, uh, with just the mineral spirits, is you can do that trimming. Say I want to make this less, less tall right there. I can change that. Uh, if I want to make this higher, I can come in and make this bush a little higher. So it's a wonderful way to do revisions. If you come in with a pencil, you get your eraser and you're doing all this amending with uh, little detail. You get the pencil, you want to start putting in all the leaves and all the twigs and all the little rocks. But this is the time where you bring all those elements that we talked about together into a painting. And not only is she thinking about it well before the painting even starts, She's thinking about it through the drawing of the thumbnail, putting the drawing onto the board. And she referred to the sketch to put it on the board, not the photo reference, because she may have made changes and actually improved the scene. So she keeps this in mind as she's drawing it on. Then she'll refer back to this basically for the colors. Mm -hmm. And you know maybe a few little details and stuff that she may want to add towards the very end. And I'll keep this handy. Um, oftentimes we we paint it and then we set it down or put it away. Now when I start the painting, my drawing is completely covered up. And if I get a little bit away from that, it's like, oh, well, let me go back to that floor plan. Let me go back to that foundation and recorrect it because this is what I like to start with. I may have gotten away from that as I start putting on paint, but I'll always go back and revert to it. I got a fairly limited palette, not totally red, yellow, blue but um, within six, seven colors. Uh, titanium white, cadmium yellow light, I have a yellow ochre, cad red light, or sometimes I'll just use a cad red, but this, this gives me a nice orange with this light warm red. I have an alizarin crimson, I have ultramarine blue, deep if I can find it. Oftentimes, depending on what I'm painting, I might throw a cobalt blue on if I have a lot of water or a big sky painting and I want to do different variations and values of, of clouds. So I have a, a place for cerulean blue, which is wonderful for the warmer part of the sky. But for now, we're just talking a little more limited palette, especially if you're going out and learning to plein air paint. Don't think of a million colors. Think of what can I mix out there? and I'm only carrying a limited amount into the field. I have a green, this is a Viridian green, a very cool green, but it does make wonderful violets and grays. Sometimes I'll put on a sap green, that's a very warm, transparent green, and I've left it off just because I'm gonna show you how to make some colors with just more limited choices. And then I usually put a transparent oxide red, which is like a burnt sienna, but it's very transparent. It's a little more rusty color. It is a dark orange. And what's wonderful, I'll show you on this one, is this is my blue, this is my orange, and it makes great grays because they're both complements. I also use this one to tone my canvas, and I tone the canvas, I'll put a little bit of this on with a towel and just wipe it to death and just take it all off with some mineral spirits. That's why you get this light peach color. You want something really neutral that's not going to detract. But if you leave a little white nugget here and there where you don't cover paint, you, got, you have that warmth that comes through. The main groups, I have my distant clouds. The sky and the distant clouds are all the same family. A lot of people want to 
make their mountains related to the foreground, and that shortens your distance and your depth. I've got my big mass of trees. I've got this neutral pink area, or neutral beige, grayish, <laughs> and we'll look at that. That's a little tougher color to mix. I have the shadow of my bushes, and then I have the light side of my bushes. So that's like kind of families, one, and this is a lighter version of this. So we have one, two, three, and four big main groups that I want to think about how I'm going to mix that. So when I mix colors, I think, what's the simplest way? I always tell my students, think of the two colors that you can use to get to that ballpark of a color. Don't, well, a third of this, and a third of that, and a third of this, and add white, and then warm it up, and then cool it down. It gets complicated when you're out in the field. How can I get the closest way? So I think two colors. What two colors on my palette will get me in that gen general area? And then I can use all sorts of different spices to add it up. And we've got blues. If I add a little white, now that's a screaming blue. That's not what we have. That might be great for the top of the sky or somewhere in the water, but that is just too intense. So I'm thinking of maybe the complement to tone it down. I'm only two colors right now. I've got, and, and white I'm just using as a value change, not so much a color. Let's add a little bit more of that. And notice the size of the pile that she's mixing up. It's going to be enough for her to do the mountains back there, and she may even just lighten it to go with the sky. Mm -hmm. She'll have to see how it looks as she goes on. But we talked about making sure you mix enough color. And notice that she's using her knife and judging what she's mixing up according to the photo. Now, if we are out in the field, you would be doing the same thing. You'd be holding it out and looking at it against the scene that you're working on to say, is this getting close to what I want? And by comparing it directly with the object that you're wanting to depict, it helps you figure it out. Whether you believe it or not, the distance between looking at something, the palette, and the painting is almost too far to judge well as to whether the value and the color that you're mixing up are going to work for what you're after in the scene. This is the farthest back element the mountains are. And so they have to reside in the background they have to be calm, and they have to stay back there. So you can't mix them too intense, or you can't have the chroma too high, or they'll want to come forward. Oftentimes they'll say, well, how did you mix that color when it's on their palette for a student? And they'll go, oh, I don't know. There's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and I kind of square. I don't remember what I used. When you go back down to just two colors, I said, well, how did you mix those mountains? Oh, I used a blue and a little touch of red. Good. When I use up this paint, I can go back to a little blue and a touch of red. So it doesn't get complicated when you start out with a, a limited palette. So what I did was added just a little white. I'm just sort of stepping back on all these. I may even just say, let's keep that sky in the same family. And it's not a white sky, it's, over, it's overcast. I could even add just a touch more of the red as we get back in here. And we'll see if I mix in with some of this. And I don't know if you're getting glare over there, but if we keep the sky in the same family, or we mix up the sky, darken it, and make our distant mountains, you're not too far off from what that distance is and you've automatically kept. Let's look at some of these trees. Green. This is my Viridian, a little yellow ochre. So you can see how green this is. This would be from our foreground. It's a little more intense. I'm going to add Viridian with this red, and we're going to get some of this dark. And it's being red, red is the complement to green, it's also going to soften it and neutralize it just a little bit so it will stay in the plane that she wants it in. And then what made that dull is adding a little red to my Viridian. I'm not going to come in and do all these stripes, I'm going to paint the dark part of the tree. So you paint from the bush on the inside of the inside of the tree. Then you start adding the values on top of it. So I can come in with just a little more of this warmth. Evergreens are very red on their tip. Now these are some beetle kill here, but I've stepped it up just a little bit 
to maybe have a lighter version of what's under. I can also even go a little deeper if I wanted to with a little blue, and that would be the inside of my trees. So she's using one color mix and then altering that for the highlight and the shadow. Everything is together then in the same family and work together to make a more homogeneous color. Rather than mixing up a bunch of separate colors, she uses that one base color and then alters it. So this is a color that people might go, well, I don't know, it's beige. You know, so where do you start? I, I sort of use these as my default grays. So if I make up a big pool of, keep in mind I'm calling this a dark orange, my transparent oxide red, make a really nice dark. That could be darks mm -hmm. underneath. Darkest dark is always going to be in the foreground. As those darks go back, they're going to lose intensity, value, and chroma. So let's add a little white, see what that does. Okay, that's pretty blue. Let's add a little bit more of my brown. I'm kind of sneaking in with a lot of these colors. And because it is a little bit pink, I could add a little bit of the red too. Brown, but I'm, I'm taking just these two colors, finding different ratios of them and adding white. One of the hardest things in working in the field is if you didn't make a big enough pile of paint or you feel that you need to adjust it, being able to go back and say, oh gosh, what did I use? Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind that all the time it takes to figure all that out is time that you've lost where your shadows are changing. Mm -hmm. So you always want to think about things in terms of, I don't want to have to remix this once I get it mixed up. And I don't want to have to adjust it too much because you lose time with your shadows then. So you want to shortcut mm -hmm anything that you can so that you can maintain your shadows right where they were when you started. I sort of work all over the place because if I put this in, I want this to relate to this. I want maybe this to relate. So I'll, I'll jump around a little bit, mainly getting my darks in, just like here, where I start to feel that's going to be my darkest darks. Everything else is going to relate. It's easier to lighten a dark than to darken a light. Once white has been introduced into a color, it's very difficult to get it dark again. That's one of the reasons a lot of artists start with the darks on their paintings and don't include any white in it, is so that they can keep those darks. She's also keeping these thin. We, we talked about going from thinner paint to thicker paint. So she's putting them in thin. She has dampened her brush first with a little bit of mineral spirits and so that the paint will flow onto the canvas and it keeps it thin. But we don't ever want to add so much paint thinner to our mixture that we're putting on that it becomes a higher proportion than the paint. The paint proportion should always be higher compared to less of the mineral spirits. Now her bottom part of her box that she's using in her palette is a similar tone to what she's got here on her canvas which allows her to mix her colors and judge them as to how they're going to look in the painting. So having a palette color similar to what your board color is allows you to figure out if the colors are going to work or not. They're too diversely different. Your eyes will throw you off as to whether those values are correct for what you're going to put in. Now this probably looks a little dark. It looks a little less red. But keep in mind, I mentioned we're going to paint the inside of the tree first, and then we're going to put on some of those nice highlighted sections on the tree. And notice that it's a bluer green than what she used in the foreground. So she can already judge that the temperature of this color is about right for the plane that it's in. Now I'm not doing all this, making all these little individual individual trees. And this is what's nice about a big brush. I just did 10 trees with one swipe. In fact, this I think I'm, I'm going to make even lighter as it, to send it back. This in this photo is fairly straight across. And when we were standing out there, this is in double cabin area up in near Dubois, Wyoming. Vary that line. Give it variety. So if I get the value to start with, 
add the seasonings. It's kind of funny. Jeannie and I both often refer to cooking things, <laughs> cooking terminology when we're talking about things in a painting because almost everybody can relate to food. <laughs> a teaspoon of this and a teaspoon of that. Sometimes maybe even making notes. If you don't have the time to do the painting when you're out there and you're just photographing, you might take a notebook and make a few notes about the colors of paint that you would use to make things so that later when you go back to it, you say, oh yeah, that was a little more blue and the picture came out a little more green. Now, if you squint your eyes on this, those distant trees disappear. These are very close in value. So what that's telling me is, I want to push this mountain back even more. So I'm going to lighten it more than what is there. So as things move back away from us, or that are farther in distance from us, we have to keep them a little bluer and a little lighter than the midground, or you won't have those planes showing up in your picture. So she's decided that, all right, I want that mountain just a little lighter than what my eyes even saw it, because in the painting, it will read better if I lighten it just a little bit more. And even with that red and uh, the oxide in it that she started with, it still reads as a lovely blue. I'll lower that mountain just a little bit. We talked about those puzzle pieces and that's what I'm doing here is coming right up against my trees. I can always cut back in to soften those edges and I'm gonna keep this whole background soft. So I've lightened it just a little bit so I get some contrast on this. And I may not have this go straight down, I might bring it up just a little bit so your eye doesn't go flying off. That's another tangent point, even the outside edge of a board or canvas that you're using. You want to take into account that when a line basically crosses that, if it's got too much of a diagonal, especially in mountains, your eye gets attracted to that because you really notice the difference. So by flattening out the mountain edge on the canvas, it kind of takes your eye off of that because that isn't where she wants anybody to look. So tangents can occur on the edge of a canvas just as much as within the painting. I made this mountain way too big for what this big mountain is. So I'm gonna take, I could wipe it out with a Q-tip. Q-tip, get out with, I, you know, a, a brush. Whoops, no, take that back. Um, or just with a paper towel and wipe it down. But I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll trim it up with my sky. And then this goes back even more. There's a little something back here. All right, let's, since we're talking about the sky, let's go ahead and put that in. It's an overcast sky that has a little more pink in it. When you look at the sky and you squint, I want you to look down here. I don't want hard edges in the sky and a bright, bright white sky. I'm gonna tone it down even more so, so that my bright area is that hot, dry, dusty wash that caught my eye with the vibrant colors. You notice how often she refers to her photograph. I think as less experienced painters, you often get an image in your head of what the scene looks like, and you don't refer back to your reference nearly as much as you should. You should continually keep checking it, because our right brain sees everything, but our left brain says things to us like, I know what that looks like, you don't need to spend more time doing that because the left brain wants to conserve energy, so it kind of tells the right brain you don't need to do that anymore. So we kind of have to fight that. That is something that painters learn to do, is to allow their right brain to continue to look at things and check to make sure it's mm -hmm. looking the way you want it to look. Um, a lot of people say, well, I can't, I have to paint behind it because the colors get mixed up. I'm sort of scooting this along with enough paint that I'm pushing the paint ridge against the other paint ridge. I'll do it down here again too. So there's enough paint on my brush that these two colors aren't really mixing. 
If they do, that's okay. It's a, a softer edge. Also in the sky, you want to look at vertical strokes. If you do all these, we've got cirrus clouds. And the light catches it and says, oh, that's a cloud there because of the ridge marks. So when you're doing just a plain, whoops, a plain sky, kind of start with just the plain uh, verticals. And that first plane back there, you want to be careful not to get that too dark because as you come forward in a painting, you get darker and darker mm -hmm. as you come up to where your focal point is. So if you get too much contrast in that first plane in the background, whether it's trees, a mountain, hills, whatever it is, you don't want that value to have too much contrast. Our eyes often tell us that there's more contrast going on out there. But if you take the foreground away with your hand and then look at the relationship with that first plane back there in the sky, you'll notice they're much closer together than what your eyes may have originally thought. So what you see when you're on top of your painting, when you're a foot away from it, and what you see when you step back often varies quite a bit. Mm -hmm. It shows you how it's going to read hanging on a wall. As Wanda was mentioning today, painting in the sun, painting in the shadow, under a tree, it all looks different when you come back in. Tone it down just a little bit for the back. So we've talked quite a bit in the painting. So she's probably been at the painting maybe 20 minutes or so, and almost half of it's done. So again, establishing the darks before she puts any colors on that have white in it. And I'm also going to put in the shadow because that is part of my dark. You can see that all of this is actually the same value. This is where her soloist or focal point is. And to help accentuate that, you put your darkest color in there. When I look at photos, I would be able to see a little lizard in that shadow. In the photo, you can't. It makes those darks way too dark. So you have to realize that um, those, those shadows are really very colorful and will have a lot more uh, transparency to them. And violet reads as a shadow color. Uh, artist instructor once told me that anything in the violet family is death to light, and that really stuck. So even though it's a blue violet, it's still going to read as a shadow. And I, I can make it purple. I see it more, I want to keep it related to this here so, and, um, and bring some of the blues around as well. We also have a little bit of this river that's back here. Touch a little bit just to make sure I've got a place setter for my water. And we could totally leave that out if we want, but um, I think because it is uh, instrumental to seeing what that area is. And repeating those background blues somewhere in the foreground helps make for a more homogeneous painting. And I'm going to lighten it so that it doesn't look like a shadow again. Still thinking puzzle pieces. Let's go ahead and maybe put in some bush tops. A warm yellow. But I also want to make two versions. So one's going to be a little deeper. I see a lot of uh, warm oranges, so we'll do sort of a transition. Um, we could just do a puzzle piece, the light side and the dark side. I've added a little transparent oxide red to my yellow light. We're trying to get that globe shape. Not doing little dot, 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 dots. So let's put in some. And 
notice again how much she's referring back to the photograph to see that she's getting her values and shapes to match what she had in the drawing as well as what's out there in the field. Let me add a touch of blue on that in the distance, a little bit lighter. See the difference between that and this? There's less yellow in it. In the photo, it's all the same. It has a tendency to homogenize everything, but I want to push those back. So you often have to make those decisions in the painting as you're working to adjust the colors that you may see in the field so that you can get it to read into planes. She's working in the mid-ground plane, so she doesn't want that to have the same vibrancy the same height of chroma that she might use slightly farther forward. If you used brighter yellows back in these areas that she's working on, they would want to pull forward and sit up here in the foreground, and you don't want that, so you have to cool that off a little bit. So this is going to be my pop, my pop area, and this is going to be fun because this is where we're going to load up the paint. You can really see how this highlight color that she's putting on there for her soloist or center of interest area contrasted to the slightly cooler color that's just behind it really pops more. Oh, I transition. So with the highlight color and the shadow color then she's going in between. And sometimes that middle color, that's a transition color between light and shadow, is a little difficult to see when you're out in the field. Anything with a little orange or uh, maybe a brownie red or something like that make very good transition colors. She's still not getting caught up in details. I'm mainly trying to see the, tra the transition of that. Establish some of my darks back here. So I'm painting front and back of the bush just by adding contrast to the, the top of the bush. Still working with large puzzle pieces. So you work mm -hmm. from larger areas down to smaller areas. Mm -hmm. You don't get caught up in all of that to start with because you can always come back in and separate areas or adjust the tones just a little bit here and there, but she's keeping those large shapes so that everything still works mm -hmm. together. And I flattened this too much, so I, I'm going to go back in with my dark, pull it back out, reshape that because it is, is, it is quite a nice round bush and I sort of took that away. But there's a lot of warmth in there. So I'm going to add some of that reflected light. It's, it's light that's bouncing back up from hot wash that's there. So you always have to take into account when light hits a very bright area, like this area through here, some of that light is going to bounce back up. And up here within this bush, you can kind of see this slight orange or warm cast that's in there. So adding that back in gives more sense of life and real reality to it. We're also looking at horizontals to lay this scene down. It'd be real easy to just make this wash like a road or a waterfall. By having these horizontals, it's going to set that road down. I mean, there's a, and you want to find ways that will help you lead in. There you know, might be some little darks that come in to help lead your eye around. We 
Again, I'm making sort of this, you know, a big puzzle piece right there. I can always come in with some lights, some more of the uh, darks. Maybe there's a, another brush over in here. Just texture. Just to break up the that big puzzle piece that we put in. That's too dark. It can't be as dark as this. This is my highest contrast, color contrast detail and edges. So now I just shape that bush by bringing down the trees um, from just behind. One little stroke right there changed the shape of that group of bushes back there. Shall we put in some of this foreground? I sort of want to resolve this over in this area. Say you're out here and this scene is just a little too much for you. Um, maybe just work on the bush. Work on something that's manageable, that gives you a lesson in that one hour painting that you're going to do. I've done that with some trees where I was not sure how to do some of the trees, so I just went out for that morning or that afternoon and did trees. So if this scene is a little too much, do the rock, just do the bush and the relationship of the mountain behind it. That in itself is a lesson. Then you could go out the next day and try the scene. Once you've accomplished maybe doing the bush or maybe you just want the river and some of that, whatever the small part is you're not sure about, do that first on a smaller board, and then maybe the next day you could go back and try the whole scene. And I think once you feel confident about some of the pieces, it makes the overall scene easier to do. We, we made this mud color over here. I'm going to mix up a whole bunch more. Just because the darks are thin, your lights are going to be rich and chunky, and radiant and reflective. It's just getting enough of it in there. So this is one of those tougher colors to get. And when you look at it, as Jeannie was first describing it, is it pink? Is it beige? Mm -hmm. It could be gray, mm -hmm. uh, but she's trying to get something that looks forward. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm also going to make it just a little bit darker keep adding lights on top of it. So tell us about your first swipes. How thick will you put the paint on for that very first swipe? Pretty thick and then I'm going to just sort of scoot it around a little bit. This is not the lightest I can go. I'm just, and my brush strokes I'm, I'm using to lead, help lead you back in. Uh, I'm looking at this color right here and then I'm going to put in some more vibrant, bigger spots of, of, of color. Now this is, what we're doing here is, is, is pretty simple because of the brevity of our talk, but it, if you're out there, keep in mind that you've got a, another hour to play with this. So kind of the rule is the first hour that you're out there kind of want to get your big puzzle shapes in there and kind of get the canvas sort of covered with paint so that you can really spend some time looking at those fine tuning things that we talked about earlier. Also going to make this warmer at the, fore the foreground. notice that she's not trying to depict all these rocks. 
She might go back in later mm -hmm. and, and indicate them, but not at first. You've got to get that big puzzle shape in there first. I made that way too light in the back. I don't want that to come forward. We'll put in a few rocks and, and we'll show you how to, how to do that. But this is mainly just blocking things in, getting the color, more color in here too. Just a few of those, those rocks and since we're talking about like, a little detail. When you've got enough paint on there, you can dab a, a, a few textural things in and, and it will cover. And so this would be very typical of a kind of a gravelly area in the spring. This would all have water in it from the mountain snow melt runoff. And it's fall, and so the water, you know, has receded back into a much smaller area than it was earlier. So that exposes all of these rocks. And so to kind of give it a sense of authenticity, she's going to add some of those little textural rocks in, but she's not going to spend a lot of time painting a bunch of individual rocks. She's just going to suggest that they're in there. And it, it just gives a little break from the color that's there. But you can also use these as lead-in helpers to help guide your eye around. And since she already has that base color down, she was just mentioning that. Notice how she just basically is using two values, the light and the dark, and the value that's there is kind of the middle value. So this would be into the second hour of the painting out in the field is she's got all the canvas covered um, she's got a little bit of those oranges from underneath showing through and she might leave some of those mm -hmm. she may decide they're too strong and, and calm them down a little bit but this is the point where you can start doing a few more fine details but prior to this you don't want to be getting caught up in the details mm -hmm. because as as your light changes everything starts shifting around and will look a little bit different you want to get all your base established. She could take this into the studio at this point and do a few more fine touches without being out in the field anymore. If it's a very hot day and she's hot and or tired or something, she has a lot of information on this. And if she's going to do a larger painting later, she has all of the colors and values established that will help her with a larger painting. And it's all about leading your eye in through the painting where you want the viewer to look. She's taking a little of the detail out, softening the darkness a little bit. All of those things will help that area kind of calm down and sit back into the painting. A lot of times you have to make judgments within the painting to have the painting work better rather than just what your eyes saw out there in the field. So here's where you can get into um, little touches of a detail and then people go, oh wow, look how much detail you put in. And it wasn't much at all. So if we take the color that's back here, we tone it down just a little bit, I'm going to see if this works. But we open this up, and here again, this is a way to bring this entry line and around behind this bush, which is just this huge behemoth of a circle. But let's open up this bush just a bit. 
sky holes can become immensely important. And sky holes, to me, when I talk about sky holes, don't mean just holes in trees. It just means the spaces in there. So sky holes are those spaces where you can see all the way through the tree or the bush into the background. And that adds to uh, a sense of realness and a sense that, yeah, that, that's a real thing there. You can kind of see through that. When we put this first shadow in, it, it probably looked pretty intense. And now, hopefully, it's calmed down. They're, the shadows are going to get lighter as they, as they get away from that, that object. They're the deepest, closest, closest to the object. And we'll lighten that up a little bit. I think we're going to make this a little wider. And the other thing that looks nice with shadows is to have some softness in some of the edges of the shadow, not hard edges everywhere in it. But we can do the same with, with these, just open up a few. And I know some of my less experienced students have asked me, why does putting that light color on the top not look like you're seeing through the bush until you back away from the painting? Mm -hmm. Here's the other small detail when you're when you're all done you can come up and put a couple little highlights in the top here and it looks like you've done all of the all of the leaves to start with and remember we just had a light side and a dark side and now we're coming in with a little eye candy Now what, I, what I'm seeing down here is a brush stroke going this direction, and that's distracting because it's uh, catching light that should be somewhere else. We're almost done here. So to me, this scene looks very much like it did at Double Cabin. Painted this scene numerous times, and we're usually there in September, so we're starting to get some fall color. But this reminds me very much of that little scene out there that uh, both Jeannie and I were attracted to paint. The thing I liked about it was the movement that you can feel with the river, and then the tree layer and the mountain layer and the sky layer, there's all these lovely layers to give you depth in a painting. When you're looking for things to paint scene-wise, you want to look for something where there's several layers that helps you create depth in a painting. And Jeannie talked about not painting a wall. As a less experienced painter, I had a really hard time with that because I was like, well, I, I like that group of trees there. But when you put it in a painting, it kind of just stops you. It doesn't allow you to go on into the scene. Having something with layers in it is a good idea. You can create an extra layer if you need to in a painting to give it a little bit more depth. But this scene already had lovely depth to it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch our videos. We hope it was helpful. Thank you so much.